right, so now that we've talked about surface area volume ratios of cells, why cells are the size that they are, we're going to talk about the types of cells, which there are two main types of cells. The first one is prokaryotic. What's the other one? Correct, eukaryotic. So prokaryotic, if the biggest thing everybody always remembers about prokaryotic cells is that they don't have what? Correct, a nucleus. So archaea and bacteria, those are the domains that include prokaryotic cells. The biggest thing everybody remembers about them is they have no nucleus. <clears throat> They're also a lot smaller, by the way. Um, they do have DNA. Remember, there were four parts of the cell that we talked about all cells having. DNA was one of them, or chromosomes. So they do have DNA. It is in a region of the cell called the nucleoid, but there's no membrane around it. So no nucleus, but an area. They have no membrane-bound organelles. However, quick comment, they do have ribosomes. It's not that we're lying to you. The thing about ribosomes is that ribosomes are not a membrane-bound organelle. When they use the term membrane-bound organelle, what they mean by that is they mean you have a cell and you have something in it, and inside of that thing, inside the membrane, it does some kind of a job. Ribosomes are not membrane-bound organelles because ribosomes do not do a job inside of them. Ribosomes are sort of a piece of machinery um, that they help with making proteins, but they're sort of like how a paperclip works. So ribosomes made of two pieces, and all they actually do is they hold something. They hold mRNA and guide the protein-making process. So when we get to ribosomes in a minute and we talk about ribosomes making protein, they don't make protein inside of them. They, in their little two little pieces, are sort of like a paper clip holding onto something, guiding a process. So when they say no membrane-bound organelles, that's true. But they do have ribosomes. Ribosomes are just not considered a membrane-bound organelle because there's no job happening inside a ribosome. So they have their four parts. They have cytoplasm, they have a cell membrane, they have ribosomes, and then they have chromosomes or, or DNA. Their DNA is actually found in a loop. I don't know if you remember our chromosomes. When we look at our chromosomes, they were sort of these X-shaped things with a little centromere holding them together. You may remember we had 46 in every cell. In, in a, uh, a bacterium, if you were to take its DNA and completely unwind it, what you'd find is it would literally be circular. So it would not have, it would not have ends on it like our chromosomes do where there's actually tips. It's actually a complete circle. So their DNA is arranged a little different, but it's still called a chromosome. So that's the overall structure of uh, all prokaryotic cells. There are a few other parts that some have. For example, some have flagella and can swim around. Some of them have a cell wall around them. A lot of them do, uh, which protects them, or even this other thing called a capsule. You don't have to know any of those parts for now. All I really want you to know is that the prokary prokaryotic ones are the ones with no nucleus, they're the smaller ones, and they still have the four main cell parts. Um, here are a couple diagrams. This one on the right is a transmission electron microscope uh, di a gra a micrograph of a prokaryotic bacterial cell. We will not be able to see that using our light microscopes. If we look at bacteria under the light microscope, we can see them. Um, I have slides of bacteria we can look at, but they're honestly, they're going to look like dots. The ones that are rod-shaped will look like little tiny rods but you would never be able to see any of the detail of their cell walls or cell membranes, and we definitely wouldn't be able to see anything inside of them. This is their DNA. Like I said, if you were to untwist it, it would actually end up being one giant loop, uh, but it looks just like all tangled and stringy, and the little dots are the ribosomes. You wouldn't have to sketch a bacterial cell again, just know the general characteristics. All right, our main focus in this chapter, though, is eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells, that's domain eukarya. These are the cells that compose protists, animals, plants, fungi. <laughs> the biggest advancement in eukaryotic cells is that they are compartmentalized, meaning they have little areas where different jobs can happen, little compartments. That's what the organelles really are. They're little membrane-bound compartments. Why is that important? Well, think about just think about your house and think about your kitchen. If you want to cook something, you can put something in the oven and you can heat it to 500 degrees and broil it and you will not get broiled because it's a compartment. It's closed off. Likewise, you can run water in your sink and it's not going to spill over and end up everywhere because that's a compartment where you can do a job. The same thing with your refrigerator and your freezer. 
you can make things really, really cold. So a cell that's compartmentalized, it's really the same idea. The mitochondria can be doing a specific job in generating huge amounts of energy. The lysosomes can have enzymes that would literally kill the rest of the cell, but they're trapped in there and they just digest stuff. And so this would allow a eukaryotic cell to be bigger and more complicated and then lead to organisms that are multicellular, whereas you don't find multicellular prokaryotic organisms. Prokaryotic cells are just very, very simple. Membrane-bound nucleus and organelles, again, those are the compartments they're talking about. They're talking about all the organelles creating these different compartments where jobs can be done. And again, they're larger, probably 10 to 100 times larger than most prokaryotic cells. We'll be able to see in our lab, we'll be able to see the eukaryotic cells very, very easily. And we'll be able to see a lot of their cell parts. We'll be able to see the chloroplast, the nucleus, the nucleolus, um, uh, vacuoles. So we'll be able to see a lot of that stuff in eukaryotic cells because it's a lot bigger than prokaryotic. All right, we're just gonna go through a few of the cell parts today and then we will um, continue with it tomorrow. So we're gonna start with from the outside in. So the first cell part is the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. It is made of a phospholipid bilayer. Guess what? You should recognize phospholipids because we just talked about them in the last chapter. So a phospholipid, um, if you remember from our last chapter, was like two fatty acids connected to a glycerol. I'm not drawing out all the carbons and stuff. These were your fatty acids. And then the third fatty acid was replaced by a phosphate group. So there was the phosphorus, and there was some other stuff over here. So in this chapter, they simplify that. Basically, they create, they, the, this is called the head, and this is the phosphate, and then these are the tails, and these are the fatty acids. So this is the representation of a phospholipid in the cell membrane rather than drawing out all the carbons and all of the parts. What's important about it, um, the phospholipid bilayer, is that it is hydrophilic and hydrophobic at the same time. So the heads, the phosphate part, just a reminder, that's our phosphate that's hydrophilic, that likes water. The fatty acids, just like all lipids, are hydrophobic, they don't like water. If you were to just pour phospholipids into a glass of water, they would form a cell membrane on their own. In other words, the, the fatty acids, they don't like water, so they would basically automatically face each other and basically form an empty cell. That's exactly what would happen if you add phosphate, uh, phospholipids to water. They will form an empty cell um, because the fatty acids will end up facing each other and the phosphates will end up facing out and in. So it makes sense. The bilayer makes sense. Why, again, is it important? Because being hydrophilic and hydrophobic, it forms a very nice semi-permeable barrier, meaning the what can enter and leave your cell is highly controlled because of the cell membrane. The proteins stuck in it, you'll notice they just represent them as these big purple blobs. We, of course, know better. Proteins in reality would have been intricately folded, secondary and tertiary, and like this one is made of two pieces, so that's got quaternary structure. They're just not showing the detail there. Um, the proteins do all kinds of things. For example, this one, you can see it looks like a little tunnel. This is like a channel. It carries things in and out. These that have carbohydrates stuck to them, these are called glycoproteins, which is going to come up in a minute. Uh, they're ID markers. So they can be used to identify your cell to other cells as belonging to you, so that your immune system, for example, doesn't attack your own kidneys because it knows that they belong there. This is also where your blood type comes from and things like that. There are these ID markers. So those are actually what are called glycoproteins. They're proteins in the cell membranes with little carbohydrate chains attached to them. Next chapter is only on the cell membrane. So we're not gonna go any further into detail here. Next chapter, we'll talk a lot more about the jobs of the proteins and how the membrane functions. But that's the overall structure. All right, the next biggest thing that you would see if you were going into a cell would be the nucleus. It's the most obvious, largest cell structure that you're going to, going to see. It is the control center, but technically, if you remember, it's really just the DNA that's controlling what proteins are made. In reality, that's more so what it's doing. It actually has um, two phospholipid bilayers. It actually is a double membrane around it, so it's very well protected, but it does have little pores in it. And I'll show you a picture on the next slide of the pores in the nucleus. 
And the, the pores will, again, regulate what can pass in and out. For example, DNA cannot leave the nucleus. It's too big. So your chromosomes are stuck in there. But RNA, the other nucleic acid, it can pass through um, and go from the nucleus out to the cytoplasm. And then, and vice versa, nucleotides can go from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. So there is control there as well. The DNA is found in a mass called chromatin, or chromatin, depending how you pronounce it. And when the cell divides, you would actually see the, the visible chromosomes. And there's a reason for that as well. We talked in the last chapter about how DNA, the job of DNA, nucleic acids, was to control what proteins are being made. If you imagine a, what a chromosome really looks like, we probably, you probably, remember it as being that little X-shaped thing. In reality, what makes that X-shaped thing is this really, really tightly, 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 tightly coiled nucleic acid. It's coiled and like super coiled into this X-shaped thing. This is sort of like you having a book that's closed. It's nice and tightly packed. In fact, imagine a notebook that has a bunch of papers in it, and it's closed. It's protected, and, uh, and if you wanted to loan it to somebody, that's how you would want to loan it to them. You'd want everything tucked in the pockets and organized so that nothing got lost. But if you actually wanted to study from those notes, in other words, if the DNA was actually going to be read and do its job and make proteins, what's going to have to happen is all these tight coils are going to have to open. So just like you would have to open a book if you wanted to see what was inside, in order for DNA to make protein, all that coiling has to go away, and this basically uncoils into this just messy, tangled mass of string. Now, RNA, which does the reading to make proteins, can come in and read little sections, because it can't fit and do that when it's all coiled up. So when the cell's dividing, the DNA is all coiled up into the chromosome so that nothing gets lost. When the cell's not dividing and the DNA is doing its job, which is controlling protein production, it has to uncoil and unwind and open up just like you opening a book and spreading out all of the pages so that you can look at the big picture and you can do something with that information. So that's what chromatin is. And, and if we could see DNA in any cell right now under our microscopes, so which I don't know that ours are powerful enough, that's what we would see. We would see a bunch of stringy stuff. If you extracted DNA from strawberries um, with Mr. Hanrahan, you might have pulled out this like white stringy mess. That's basically what you were seeing. You were obviously weren't seeing chromosomes. You were just seeing a big tangled mass of like, like lots and lots and lots of DNA in order for it to be enough to be visible to you. Um, and there's also an area in the nucleus called the nucleolus. And the nucleolus, it doesn't have a membrane around it or anything. It's just a dark area. And its job is to make our RNA. RNA is one of the nucleic acids, ribonucleic acid. Does anybody remember what the little R is for? I heard a lot of mumbling. Yeah, ribosomes. So ribosomes are ribosomal. This is actually the RNA that the ribosomes are made out of. The other two kinds you may remember are mRNA and tRNA, messenger and transfer. Ribosomal RNA, and on the next slide when we talk about ribosomes, it's going to come up again. But that's what the ribosomes are actually made of. So the, uh, the parts for ribosomes are, are manufactured in the nucleolus, and then the ribosomes assemble outside of the nucleus. All right, this is a, an electron micrograph of the nucleus. Um, this one, you can see the outside, looks kind of like the moon. All these little uh, holes are pores, and these other ones that are sort of uh, facing out are actually little ribosomes on the outside. And if you look in detail under a transmission electron microscope, this is what the pores of the nucleus actually look like. So they're actually very complicated looking little pores that are letting things in and out of the nucleus. So that's what the pores look like. Usually in a sketch, we see it like this. Here's that mass I was talking about. See how you, there's like a bunch of little purple strings everywhere. That's the, um, that's the chromatin I was talking about. And the dark area is the nucleolus. So that's, um, those are the parts. Outside of the nucleus, that other thing, that's the ER, which is actually the last part we'll talk about today.